Thanks. So I'm Mike Savage. I'm Professor of Sociology here at the LSE. Um, <laughs> I'm also convene a theme of research at the International Inequalities Institute on Wealth, Elites and Tax Justice, which is uh, very closely linked to the, to the theme of this closing panel. Um, and I'm delighted with the panel we have in front of, in front of us. Um, it's, it's, it's really going to be hard for them to speak in just 10 minutes about their their research and their interests. One point I will make for any of you who have um, been to the previous panel on uh, empire, there's, there will be some links um, as we will discuss about the imperial histories, or at least, at least I think there will be, and I think we'll explore whether, whether those links exist. Okay, so let me introduce the speakers. We're gonna start with Neil Cummins, who's a professor of economic history here at the LSE. Neil is uh, the leading expert in the world on British probate data. So he has downloaded and digitized um, every will, I'm probably exaggerating a bit, every will left in the in UK archives over decades. And this has given him an unparalleled opportunity to think about wealth inequality trends over the long durée. So we'll start with Neil. He'll give us some historical context. Then we'll pass on to Arup Chatterjee. Arup is the research manager of the Wealth Inequality Theme at the Southern Centre for Inequality Studies at the University of Witzvoortesrand in South Africa. I mean, South Africa, of course, absolutely picks up on the imperial link we've heard about in the previous session with its former colonial status in the British Empire, but also the history of apartheid and racism, which was a big theme of our previous discussion. So, and then finally, pass on to Kristin Surak who is Associate Professor of Sociology at the LSC. And Kristin is doing a fantastic book looking at the sailor citizenship. Um, and she'll, she'll explain it for herself, but it's a really important phenomenon in which wealthy and rich people are buying citizenship. And we'll, she'll discuss what's involved in that. So it's a great uh, panel. I'm looking forward to chairing it. Um, 10 minutes each maximum. So Neil, over to you. Okay, um, thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, so uh, just a quick disclaimer, I massively overprepared these slides, so I'm going to cut lots. I'm just like so excited to get out of my little academic bubble and talk to uh, real people, I guess. Uh, not that academics aren't real people. But anyway, uh, pushing on, this is going to be a very, very brief and um, you know, from a certain individual's perspective, my perspective, history of wealth inequality um, based on my own empirical research. So, you know, why bother? Well, right at the core of academic economics, popular economics, and just dinner table conversations that we all have is a fundamental, you know, divide between how we think the gains from capitalism, capitalism should be shared or concentrated um, within our society. So you can think of David Ricardo, Karl Marx, and recently, of course, Thomas Piketty uh, as really striking a popular nerve um, on this issue. Um, and as I said, the left and right political division, you know, really traces the, you know, itself back to this, which way are you gonna go on this? And based on, you know, certainly this was the discourse um, over the past couple of years, based on how, wealth is accumulating to the top, say, uh, 1%. Um, some argue that capitalism is just fundamentally broken. So it's important to look at this to interpret historical trends and also to basically have, um, before we make, say, any moral conclusions, to look at what the empirics tell us. So let me give you some context. There's no kind of contest, I think, thinking that inequality broadly defined in terms of, you know, um, you know, diets, heights, um, you know, lifespan has broadly declined since the period of the Industrial Revolution, for example. But a lot has happened, say, over the 20th century that is really open to interpretation. And let me kind of take you through it. So basically, our picture of the, say, wealth um, and also the income um, inequality uh, trajectory since, say, 1900 has involved a massive decline in the share of the top 1%. And this is, it's really wealth that we care about. Wealth is driving most of inequality. There's, you know, and this kind of decline, this I've, I've sketched from my own data, but this is the kind of thing that Piketty really focused upon, the decline of the top 1% and why this happened. And there's lots of different theories. 
Um, this is the share of the top tenth of a percent and the share of the rest of the top one percent. And you can see you can add them together. It's about 70 percent of all wealth um, around 1900 in this country down to, say, um, about 40 percent when you add them together um, in, in 1980. Um, and this kind of led to kind of a rise of or democratization or a great equalization of wealth in this country. So that broadly defined blue section is, there, is the entirety of the top 10%. And that's their share declining over time, the top 10% here. Um, and then the rest of the bottom 60% is not really getting anything in terms of wealth. Um, so we got to remember that, you know, the great equalization was really still about a reshuffling of wealth within the top deciles and the median person in England still pretty much dies with no significant wealth. Something to bear in mind, but you've got to ask yourself a critical question. Where is this data coming from? All the wealth data that we have from the 20th century comes from self-declared wealth, okay? Now you might start to think, what's the relationship between self-declared wealth and actual wealth that you own, okay? And what I propose to you is that this entire decline is illusory, okay? The reason why it's illusory is that it exactly corresponds to massive hikes in taxes in the 20th century. So just taking this wealth, wealth at death, the probate data that, that Mike mentioned, look at these hikes in tax rates. The top marginal rate, these are like... Um, 2015 prices on estates of 100 million, which there's not many of them. But in the 1950s, the top marginal rate goes to approximately 85%. Now, if you've got 100 million, okay, and you know, you, you, you know, you're presumed you're going to die one day, right? And you know that 85% of it is going to be taken away. What are you going to do? Okay, you're going to move it around so that on your real wealth, you're spending, you're, you're losing significantly less than 85%. So part of my research has used this individual level data that Mike mentioned, um, and that's the kind of key innovation here. It's individual name data. And you can use this to track specific families over more than a century and look for families where wealth seems to disappear suspiciously, okay? And you can crank the statistics on this and work out that at least one third, and this is a minimum, of elite wealth is just missing, invisible, or more provocatively, hidden, okay? And this hidden wealth, you might think this is, this is some statistical artifact, but you see it in modern uh, outcomes in terms of the value of the house there to be these people's descendants are living in, in 1999. You might ask how I know that, I'm more than happy to tell you, but hey, 10 minutes. Uh, Oxford and Cambridge attendance rates. So this is being translated into uh, schooling and education expenditure. And also, more tellingly, you can find these families appearing statistically much at a much higher rate in the as offshore account holders in the offshore banking leaks of 2013 to 16. So when you do all this together, you can eliminate at minimum one third of the decline and the suggestion of the top wealth shares. And the suggestion is, is this, if you could actually, this is telling you that maybe the majority, all of the decline perhaps is actually illusory. And you can actually find distinctive specific dynasties that are hiding billions. So yeah, Mike mentioned the data, and um, I'll basically try and kind of speed up now. <laughs> and basically, you can see this cool little data, digitized it. It's all kind of a lot of fun. This is John Ellerman, the richest probated man in English history. Um, this man, this wealth did not go missing. He actually founded a trust that funds the Scottish Ballet and bumblebees. Um, so basically, you can see this idea, you track these families over time. And here's an example of just the wealth that appears at death, and then these descendants, just this wealth has just gone missing, okay? There's a statistical methodology that you employ, you aggregate to groups, you project forwards, there's lots of observables in terms of tax paid, and uh, so forth. Um, yeah, you can do lots of things looking, looking up my own name. My own name is not distinctive enough to give you any information. You want to go a little bit kind of more finely grained than that. I anonymize all the information, but you see all this missing wealth in these families. Now, to speed up here, because I'm conscious that I'm losing my time, when you do this for everybody, you see that basically wealth, your, that gray line is the predicted wealth. There's new wealth being created, but not as much as you might think until the asset price rise of the late 1980s. But for these richest Victorian families, as soon as you hike tax rates, their wealth suspiciously disappears for a generation, okay? 
then when you look at them, and these are these families, again, anonymized, you'd have to buy me a lot of drinks for, you, for me to tell you who these people are. Um, uh, and so, so I am bribable, let's be honest. But basically, um, you can use this to then basically find out where they're living uh, and so forth. And again, remember, this is just a, a health warning. This could be just bad luck. These dynasties could just make terrible decisions, marry the wrong person, go off to Monte Carlo, gamble, smoke, and live the high life on the Grand Tour. But basically, statistically, at the group level, this is predicting these outcomes I mentioned today. So, um, yeah, the observed decline in wealth and quality may be entirely driven by this hidden wealth. The rich are not randomly rich, <laughs> you know, they don't get rich by writing a whole load of checks, you know, there are a set of behaviors that keep these people over the top. And I've got other research who suggests that the rich and the poor, the basic social position, uh, you can predict that over centuries uh, using other types of data. Again, I massively overprepared, I'll park this, uh, skip through all this and just say thank you and um, uh, you can see my papers on my website. Cheers. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Actually, 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 time is fine. Well done. So, Arup. <laughs> Left and right. Yeah. <laughs> Over to Arup. All right. Um, cool. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here uh, to talk about you know, a really important conversation. I've perhaps taken the question that was in the uh, in the advert a bit, a bit more literally. Uh, and, you know, and I've tried to answer about, uh, you know, about the rich, the challenge of wealth inequality, but taking South Africa to give perhaps a case study uh, of a global South perspective. Um, but, but what's interesting is that there are perhaps a lot of continuities from Neil's presentation. Uh, what I aim to suggest is that the rich getting richer is perhaps not the main uh, challenge of wealth inequality, but rather it's the persistence and the concentration of ownership of assets um, that, that are maintained over generations. Um, this is the main challenge of wealth inequality, uh, and I'll hopefully be able to show you that on the following slides. So to answer the question, are the rich getting richer? Most likely, Yes, this is just in the last year. Um, headlines that have happened also in the UK, the US and, uh, and mainland Europe. Uh, but perhaps what's uh, maybe a bit more surprising in, uh, in South Africa for sure is that it was uh, not expected that we'd get new millionaires. But it's unsurprising as, at the same time, given that there's relatively uh, few people that uh, are at the top end of the distribution that have these work from home uh, opportunities that can maintain their jobs that have access to assets and capital incomes um, and i'll and i'll talk to that a bit later in uh, in some of our work that we've done so pre-covid uh, myself and some colleagues at the world inequality lab we estimated the distribution of wealth uh, from the transition to democracy uh, to just pre-COVID. And, and there's some very startling trends that we see, but I think the key one that I, I want to point out here is the fact that you just see this constant persistence of the shares at the top end. So the top 1% share uh, is actually increased slightly, just under 50 to 55%. Uh, the top 10% share has stayed uh, roughly at 85%, uh, and the bottom 50 below zero, uh, and has uh, generally gotten worse with some blips that can be attributed to various policy uh, initiatives. Uh, if we go into the specifics, say for 2018, uh, again, I'll just direct your attention to, to three specific um, things from the table. So you see the top 0.1% have a 15% share that is equivalent to the bottom 90%. The top decile, uh, 3.5 million people, 85%. And, uh, you know, the bottom 50%. And I think this is really uh, what captured a lot of uh, attention when we released these findings. Uh, this happened, perhaps, you know, our working paper came out just as the pandemic was 
was hitting South Africa, is that you see that the bottom 50% on average are in net debt uh, or have, sorry, that's meant to say have zero wealth. And this really demonstrated how vulnerable uh, so much of the population were um, with no access to assets or saving in the event uh, of a shock to the economy, loss of jobs, i.e. the pandemic that was about to hit us. Uh, a key feature again of, of the wealth distribution in South Africa was the domination of ownership of all classes of assets. Um, and you know, here I can direct your attention to directly owned bonds and stocks, um, where pretty much all of it is held uh, by the top decile. But I think the, the key thing that I want to uh, perhaps draw your attention to is this persistence. So despite having a strong mandate, a political mandate to address inequality, we see that the top 1% share has stayed uh, relatively flat, as I mentioned before, increased a little bit. Over the longer period, you can see that the nature of asset ownership has changed, so it's become a far more financialized. Now, when we disaggregate this according to age cohorts, you can see that this, uh, this inequality persists um, or, or it's demonstrated across even the younger age cohorts. Um, and this perhaps indicates uh, the importance of inherited wealth. We don't have the fantastic data that, that Niels had access to in South Africa, um, but we'd certainly like to get our hands on some just to quantify that. But I think we, this, this gives some indication of the importance of intergenerational wealth. So, so the second question uh, that was in the uh, advert uh, for the event was, should we look at taxing uh, to support a post-COVID world? Um, and the long and short of it is that we thought, yes, this would be a good intervention to help uh, some of the policies that were being widely discussed to support uh, the vulnerable in South African society. Um, and, and we thought this partly because of the concentrated nature of wealth, which made it, uh, which made the, the administrative targeting uh, a smaller, smaller group of people that would be required um, for the revenue service to target. Um, I think we had very similar uh, similar reactions to the Wealth Tax Commission here in the UK. It will be unsurprising to hear that the wealthy weren't that keen to be taxed. But this uh, is something that perhaps I'd just like to stop here and say that uh, this is not the this is not the the key challenge or the key um, requirement when dealing with wealth inequality. South Africa already has quite a significant welfare and redistributive state, uh, various grants um, and redistribution to social functions. And as I alluded to earlier, it's a continued concentration in the hands of a few. Um, and the processes that are used to maintain this wealth um, that are a key pillar of this persistent inequality. So what we've tried to do in our research projects is to look a bit wider um, let me skip past this in the interest of time, is to, is to look at some features of wealth inequality in the, in the global south. We have partners in Brazil and India that are helping uh, us to, to look at these things. Um, this is just to note that we're not saying when we're looking at the global south that these are, uh, are specific features um, of um, the global south where each country is the same. And we're not saying that these are features that don't exist in the global north, but just that um, perhaps some of the connected uh, historical experiences, uh, the structures of the economy can perhaps provide some light into, into new features of wealth inequality that are, are worth studying. So these are some of the key things. I'll highlight social stratification. So in the case of India, um, our colleagues are looking at caste and religion. Um, we're looking at race. Um, and it's just to note that these aren't necessarily categories, um, but processes themselves through which a wealth generation happens. I think one of the really interesting things about focusing on wealth is uh, the definition of assets 
uh, where the benefits and the flows of assets are exclusive to the owners. Um, and some of these exclusionary processes can occur in these wider social groupings. And, and that's something that we're quite keen to, to understand. The intergenerational mechanisms uh, often are focused on inheritance. Uh, but they can happen through business successions, uh, especially in the case of Brazil, and our colleagues are, are helping us uh, understand that. Uh, I think I'm potentially running out of time. Um, so what I wanted to mention was that the concentration of wealth, it really points to the domination of economy uh, by a, a few, a relatively small number of people. And in this respect, we think that an elite lens can really help us unpack some of the social, political and economic processes um, that have been a key to producing the wealth distribution that we see. Just to perhaps give, an uh, give two examples of historical processes that are very important in contemporary inequality. Uh, in the apartheid era, the, the conglomerate structure where six or seven companies dominated the economy, they still largely dominate uh, the stock exchange today, uh, albeit in very different forms. Uh, they've been unbundled, um, globalized, and, and so on. But many of those on the rich lists in South Africa uh, are heavily linked to these companies. A second uh, example of this uh, on the on the left, you'll see the model apartheid city. This was the template during apartheid that pretty much every, every city followed. You had the commercial center, the industrial center, um, buffer zones, um, and then the living zones uh, for, um, you know, for the townships uh, where the excluded black population uh, were forced to relocate. These reinforced accumulation processes, and uh, there were pretty much no opportunities to accumulate capital to form, uh, uh, to, to form a, a middle class. And you'll see from the earlier table, there's almost a missing middle. Um, what you see on the right is, is in Johannesburg, Santon, which is the financial center uh, of uh, Johannesburg, and it could be described as a financial center of South Africa and Alexandria, which is the which is the township, and if it's it's exactly the same uh, pattern that you see on the left, uh, very little has changed despite um, despite this being a contemporary setting. So um, this is there's a lot more to say, uh, and I I think that I've run out of time, but we are looking. Um, more broadly at, at other important features of wealth accumulation, uh, such as the future of work. Um, and a lot of our research can be found on our website here. So please come visit and um, yeah, and engage with our research and, and have a discussion. Thanks Thank very much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. That was a terrific um, uh, reflection on trends in South Africa and the Global South. Very, very important. Okay, we're going to move on finally to Christian Surak. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit today about a book I have coming out next year with um, Harvard University Press on this market in um, citizenship. And I don't know if in the, um, let's see if this is moving forward, maybe not. Is this one? Yeah. Okay. In the pre-COVID world, when everybody was flying all the time, I don't know if any of you remember this from the in-flight magazine in British Airways, where um, remarkably, because everybody had been on the plane, they had to have already shown a passport to get on there if it was international. There was always a pull-out section on global citizenship, where you could um, purchase citizenship in Dominica, um, Grenada, or St. Kitts and Nevis. And so this is, this is really the sort of the industry that I'm looking at, the citizenship by investment industry, what, what's often colloquially known as golden passports. In a way, it's a little bit different from golden visas, which you also hear about in the media quite a bit, where you're investing in getting residents in a country, and citizenship is a little bit heftier in a way than residents, 
you know, it goes for the whole family. You can pass it down, thinking about inheritance as well. It's also a little bit different from discretionary economic citizenship. I mean, any sovereign can make anybody it wants into a citizen, you know, give it, a, you know, do something for a country will make you a citizen. And those sorts of deals go on off. On, on a one-off basis all the time. But with citizenship by investment programs, what, what we're looking at here is the way that, you know, through a formal program, it's all completely legal. You can go on a government website and find out about it. But basically you either donate a certain amount of money to a government or invest a certain amount of money into a country and you become a citizen. Usually, you know, somewhere between about 100,000 US dollars and maybe about 2 million. Um, now, what I'm looking at in my own research is how this market works. That is, why do countries sell citizenship? And what do they get out of it? And what do people there think about it? And then why do people want to buy it, buy it in the first place? A lot of these countries are very small micro states, fairly peripheral. You know, what are they getting out of it? And it's not all about money laundering and tax evasion either. Most of the story really isn't that, in fact. And then I'm also interested in the way that geopolitics structure supply and demand in this market. So even though citizenship is this bond between a sovereign subject, it's really about politics and geopolitics in terms of the way the market works. And then what this, this tells us about inequality today. Um, so if we look globally at countries that have, you know, sort of legal provisions that allow for the sale of citizenship for a specified price point, a specified way, there's about 20 or so that have these opportunities available. Um, however, most of these programs are completely insignificant, doing really, really small numbers. If you look at, and this is what my, a lot of my research has been looking at this in a, in a sort of both quantitative and qualitative way. I've been to about 16 countries, done hundreds of interviews, and I've also amassed a lot of data on these programs as well. And if you look at the trends in who's going for these programs and which programs are going for over time, here you can see that the countries in the Caribbean are in purple, um, the ones in the EU are in green, the ones in, in the Pacific really are in blue, and then there's Turkey in the red. So here you can see how historically, you know, it was small microstates in the Caribbean doing a lot of these approvals. In fact, in some of these countries, the, the income or the revenue coming in from citizenship by investment is up to 30 to maybe even 50% of GDP. So they're huge for these countries. Um, small numbers in the EU, despite, you know, the fact that um, it gets a lot of coverage in the media. But the biggest story most recently has been the explosion of Turkey. Turkey has been doing about half the approvals globally um, in, in the past couple of years, um, especially since COVID. Um, and these are just approved applications. So on each application, there's usually family members included. So if we, you know, about 2.6 uh, or 1.6, you get 2.6 people. So it's about 50,000 people naturalizing through these um, programs every year. Now, uh, if we look at demand, um, so if we're, since we're looking at wealth and inequality today, um, breakdowns are hard to come by. You know, for example, the Chinese never really show up in the numbers very well because countries that do big numbers in Chinese, like St. Kitts, which does big numbers overall, doesn't report them because China doesn't allow dual citizenship. So, so there's a little bit of a politics in terms of um, you know, finding out some of these data. But if we look look at this, you can see how, you know, in the lower section in these Caribbean countries, there's, you know, people from China in blue, people from the Middle East in red, people from Russia in uh, green and others in, in purple. You can see how, you, you know, people get channeled into particular countries. Dominica does a, little, a lot of Middle Easterners for particular reasons. Antigua has more of a link into China, for example. I think also interesting is the, the upper level um, one looking at the EU, because there's been a lot of talk about, you know, these, these programs in the EU are all about Russian criminals, um, you, you know, getting access to the EU. Russians are just under 50% of approvals. Um, with also, you know, still significant numbers from, from China and the Middle East as well. And if you look at golden visa numbers, people getting residence, it's Russians really drop off so that the total numbers for the EU are about 20% um, for Russians as well. Um, oh, if we look at demand um, in general, it turns on, our, on, its, on, on its head some of our presumptions about citizenship and the way it works. Because people want citizenship in these places, not for the rights it gets them within the countries, but for the rights it gets them outside of the countries, in third countries, which we usually don't think about in terms of citizenship. You think about the right, rights it gets you in where you, where you are, a citizen, but, but it also gets you rights outside of this. And this means that it can become heavily um, structured by politics and geopolitics. So what do I mean by this? I'll give a couple of examples by looking at the key motives that people have um, that I've gotten out of doing um, a lot of interviews. Um, so why do people go for these um, programs in the first place. Well, the first big reason is present mobility. 
it's visa-free travel. It's easier applications for visas. Or if you're a US citizen, it can be a quote unquote peaceful passport. Um, you know, what, a quote from one of my interviews that um, exemplifies this is he may be rich, but if he can't travel to London whenever he wants, he will always be second class. Second big reason is future mobility. So a second citizenship can be an insurance policy. If you're living under an authoritarian regime and you don't know what's gonna happen next, you might go for this as an option just you know, to hedge your risks in effect. You also find this, for example, with um, US citizens, the Armageddon Americans, oh my God, Trump got elected president, I need a second option. Oh my God, Biden got elected president, I need a second option, et cetera. And you can see this, you know, this, this is exemplified by an example from my interviews where the person was saying how, you know, the key thing is to retain flexibility. You want to have options. Um, and then third, um, people are looking at business opportunities. Let's see, I'm not even sure where to put, okay, here we go. Um, so if you're starting a business, you're opening a bank account, you're trying to get lines of credit, nationality matters. Um, as a, one of my interviewees put it, you know, it's easier to be European if you're doing business in Europe. It's just much more efficient. You can get better protections for your businesses based on your nationality as well. Now, a lot of people think this is all about tax evasion, but tax is really complicated. There's loads of different types of taxes. It's highly individualized. It depends often on physical presence, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, so, but from a business angle, you know, they can also sometimes lower your import taxes as well, but it's really much more about maximizing business opportunities overall. So what does this mean in general after this brief tour? What can we take away from this? Now, connecting back to this theme of inequality, it's really about this intersection between inter-country inequality, inequalities between countries, and intra-country inequality and in inequalities within countries. So a large proportion of people who choose this are wealthy people, especially from outside of the West. So they're, you know, they've done well within that intra-country inequality, but being outside of the West, they're looking to improve their personal prospects, you know, th getting things like a privileged passport, better business deals, a more secure fu future than what their home country can offer them. It's sort of maximizing their opportunities. And this is because, as I mentioned before, citizenship is not about the rights it gets a person only within a country, but those extraterritorial privileges as well. And I'll just wrap up quickly with a couple of upshots on what this means for citizenship, because it really turns around some of our, our everyday assumptions about how it operates. So this is not a story of immigration and people moving to a country and then national naturalizing. It's, you know, people aren't moving to tiny micro states or whatever. It's their money that moves there. And so also, um, we get to see how here citizenship too is not really about membership in a nation state as you know being a member of the community and then being a member of the state it's really just about being a member of the state um, you know it's they're taking on that legal umbrella that the state offers it's very instrumental in that sense and we also see that citizenship here isn't an identity laden singular membership but rather a leveraged legal status um, that can be used to secure increased rights and benefits so I'll stop there. Um, if you're interested, I've done a lot of got a lot of publications out of the the, um, the massive amount of qualitative and quantitative research I've been on that, and you can access all this um, on my website. But yep, that's it. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Kristin. I, I'm going to throw it open to the audience for questions in just one minute. But I just want to spend. Um, half minute suggesting some themes around are the rich getting richer and what, what is it what is the challenge of wealth and equality having heard neil and arup and christian i think actually we should be a bit cautious about this they which are getting richer perhaps they are a little bit here and there but that's in some respects that that's not the fundamental issue you might say um the issue i think which came out of all the talks is, well certainly Arup and neil is a persistence issue actually it's really difficult to challenge wealth and equality and that's partly because this came out from all three of you actually the wealthy people are really good at planning and thinking about how, how do we avoid being taxed and 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 the strategic behavior is a key feature and i think also my final provocation is that that strategic behavior can tilt over into kind of challenging the nature of citizenship itself and that may be seen to be the really significant challenge of wealth and equality not necessarily the rich are getting richer um, this is a bit provocative, perhaps they are a bit, but, but actually it's the way that they're bending citizenship and bending the nature of gov government and um, lawmaking to fit their strategic interests. Anyway, that was just designed to put a few things together. Uh, let's, what we'll do is we'll have questions in batches of three to try and um, we have 
one, one person there, and then one at the back. Thank you for the very interesting panel discussion. Um, this discussion made me think, well, the wealthy will obviously continue to hide their assets or dodge their taxes as long as there are countries that are uh, available to uh, store assets and anonymize these assets, or as long as there are policy loopholes. So what is the current state of international policy and international law with all of this? Is there, is there collaboration? Yeah, well, thank you, that's a good question. Let's get two more and then we'll ask replies. Hi there. Uh, this question is for uh, uh, Dr. Sarek in uh, particular. Uh, at the beginning of your uh, presentation, you mentioned one of the things you meant. I'm here. <laughs> uh, one of the things you mentioned at the very uh, beginning of your presentation was uh, one of the things you researched was the uh, opinions of the uh, the islanders or the 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 the, uh, the population of the the states that sell these. But in your actual presentation, you don't uh, detail that. Maybe you could uh, still expand on that, please. Another question? Yep, yeah. So compare with UK and other European countries, um, like French have uh, French Revolution, China actually have a cultural revolution. If 100 years ago, UK have a complete revolution about redistribution of the wealth, will it be different from now? Okay, big question, that one. Um, so uh, should we just ask each of you to respond to how we want to, but question, let's begin with you, because there's a specific question about your presentation. Sure. Um, in terms of local opinion, it, it's very varied, to be honest. It's not all that all the time that people are saying, oh, my God, I can't believe we're doing this. Or, oh, the government's so corrupt. Although in some countries, people do say that. It's like, oh, I can't believe we're doing it. Oh, I but what I found, very, but in some countries, it's actually a real source of national pride. Um, as well. So I was really struck when I went to St. Kitts and I was talking to local people. Um, out, of, out of 20 you know, local people I just encountered on the streets or whatever, um, 19 of them were in support of the sale of citizenship. And they were saying, you know, what else do we have? And it, it's a very, you know, politics is a big deal in the country. It's a big deal in the Caribbean. It's sort of like a sport almost. And they would say, oh yeah, the current regime is so corrupt, but the previous regime is great. Or the, you know, the previous regime was so corrupt that the current regime is great. But the idea that, um, you know, what else do we do? You know, what are other options? In, in a place like St. Kitts where the program has been around for decades, you know, it's become very, very naturalized, normalized. When it's, when it's very new, you know, so if, when the program was introduced in Malta in 2013, it became very heavily politicized. Um, and there's been a lot of contra controversies over that, you know, over the course of years. Support or lack of support tends to map very closely onto um, political party affiliation as well. So it's one of those things that can, can become political football, or, but it changed. It's very varied country to country. I hope you want to apply to anything. Um, yeah, I, I think perhaps just um, just a brief thought on the um, on the sort of international law question. Um, but, uh, but but not if you don't mind not specifically addressing um, addressing that there are initiatives in place to you know, where the tax authorities are uh, building systems that talk to each other, um, focus on residencies, share information, um, and link it to the banks, crucially. Um, I, I, and I think all of those will help. But of course, uh, as Mike was saying, the, the proactive nature of, uh, you know, of the super rich to defend their wealth means that, uh, you know, armies of lawyers and accountants can always find ways around that. Um, but in in this in the specific example of say a wealth tax that is uh, needed for a specific policy intervention, I think the rationale for that is slightly different to um, to these uh, regular requirements for taxes. Um, so where wealth taxes have been implemented for specific interventions, the objective has been more to raise a certain amount of money to cover an anticipated budget. So. The question becomes, um, or the desperation becomes a bit less to close as many loopholes as possible, but more to see kind of from almost from a zero cost, how much can we raise that will allow us to meet our policy objective. Um, and so, you know, in that respect, perhaps there's um, a slightly different um, ambition when it comes to thinking about assets as a tax base. 
Okay, Nick? Yeah, great. This leaves this juicy uh, revolution question to me, which, oh God, I could talk for hours on this. The short answer is no. Okay. So basically one strand of my research is based on looking um, at the elite structure of say English life over say the past 1000 years and doing this in all sorts of different measures. And the idea is to get a, what's the underlying rate of social mobility across generations um, correctly calculated because people have different aspects of status. You can, you can throw all your status into wearing a crown and, you know, um, you know, all these things where you can save your money and not spend so much of it. Um, and once we look at um, the structure of, of, of elite society, you just see a stunning persistence in who the rich are and who the poor are and everything in between. And so I can tell you now, the Norman conquerors of this island, um, basically uh, their descendants are doing better than the average English um, today, uh, a thousand years after the conquest. And so England has had, you know, since then, <laughs> had a relatively benign, you know, experience in terms of revolutions. There, the things have happened, but not like the French Revolution, not like uh, what, what China. But I mean, I can point to other work, which once you look at multi-generational effects, um, unless uh, there's some sort of extinction of family lines, not to get all too dark here, but like basically... The, the, yeah, people seem to bounce back to where they were pre-revolution. Yeah, I mean, it's there's just a stunning persistence in 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 that structure of of, of human social life. Um, so um, yeah, um, and it's it's just fascinating to see this in in the data. Um, and and China is pretty much the, the the hierarchy is uninterrupted pretty much in terms of the relative status. It's depressing. depressing. Point, Beth. Good point. Yeah. Question over here. Yeah. Does the idea of hidden wealth safeguard the, the wealthy from any um, degradation in the economy if it happens? Like if a bubble bursts, uh, do they automatically lose all that wealth? And why do some progressive movements have problems with the idea of universal basic income? Okay, thank you. Um, if, if there's some female questioners. Okay, let's we'll get for you back there first. But, but behind you. The economic crisis of 2008-9, which seemed to have led to what is described as a shift in generational debt. So can someone comment on how those kind of crises, uh, whether it's a depression of the 20s or the crisis of 28, oh, 2008, 9, could have had an impact on mobility and movement of uh, economic value from one group to another or from generation to generation. And let's put the front here. Sorry. I have a very basic question. Um, you talked a lot about data, uh, which is very interesting. Um, do you think that the current situation of inequality anywhere in the world uh, will change in years to come? Or is that going to remain as it is pretty much? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So shall we get some any replies you want to make? Neil, do you want to start this time? Well, there were two directly at, at the topic, so I'll be quite brief. I mean, it was on hidden wealth and, and the two can be rolled into one. The one about hidden wealth and are you protected then from these bubbles? And then there was the one about the, the crises, which is kind of, they're both kind of related. So basically you can actually look at the rate of return on wealth um, uh, by, by, by a wealth class based on the composition of their portfolios. Um, um, and you see that the rich earn a much higher return on, 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 on their wealth. And so remember, these guys are getting the best advice. And my, my current sense would say the current crypto drama is that it seems to be the naive investors that are getting absolutely wiped out, right? The people bought in, bought, the bullshit and basically threw all their money in and the, the clever investors are are doing just fine thank you very much they're probably you know uh, they're getting away with it and then i think there was a question about data but but maybe i'll pass it on i can't remember what it was i'm sorry yep. uh, okay thank you yeah some interesting questions that i'm not sure i have um all the answers to um in, in south africa there's um a lot of the progressive 
advocacy groups have called for a universal basic income. And there's been um, some, well, the most serious discussion of institu uh, instituting one for, um, you know, for the last 20 or so years. Um, interestingly, the discussion has also been about how to use, uh, you know, the concentration of wealth to fund that. So there's been some discussion of um, a wealth tax to fund a, a universal basic income. Um, but at, at the moment, what it's, uh, what it's um, turned out to be has been a COVID grant, um, which is, is still a big step for um, South Africa that has really focused gr its grants on old age, disability, but, but not the general population who, who are suffering from unemployment. Uh, so, um, so, you know, there are critics of a universal basic income compared to a targeted uh, basic income. Um, but but I think that the progressive movements have taken that on board, especially in the context of um, of this extreme inequality. Um, the question um, about data, um, I, I didn't quite catch if you were saying does will the data show anything different about wealth inequality or whether um, you're just asking a question about do you, do we see any change in wealth inequality? So to <clears throat> paraphrase perhaps what I asked uh, we talked about years of years on, on, on years of inequality is it going to change uh, do you think inequality will become less of an issue in the future what does the data that you have tell you does that, does that make sense should I uh, sh sure but it does sound like an impossible question to answer <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I mean I think this is why um, why at, at our center we're trying to understand the processes that lead especially to wealth inequality um, and, and trying to understand how future accumulation policies could be shaped uh, to have more equitable outcomes. So one of the projects that I mentioned that um, one of my colleagues is, is leading is the future of work. Um, you know, the fourth industrial revolution has has been uh, touted as the sort of savior of of the world and you know future economies and so on what the what the project is doing currently is trying to understand actually how does that play out in terms of inequality in countries like south africa and um, there are but you know there are a lot of equivalent outcomes uh, in the uk as well um say you know the um the uberization of of um a lot of processes um, but but then you know from understanding these processes, we hope that we can shape it, whether it's through legislation or um, you know or through other forms of uh, organisations um, such as worker involvement in boards and so on. That that could reduce some of that inequality. Um, but you know that's well, I'll, I'll meet you in twenty years' time and <laughs> and see if there's been any change. Okay, Christian, do you want to add anything? Yeah, well, I can just um, tag, I mean, I think most of the questions have been addressed, but I can just tag on in, in the sense in terms of, I mean, a lot of this discussion is focusing on wealth and inequality for obvious reasons. But if I think about my own work, um, for example, the 2008 economic crisis, much less important than COVID, because these are not just simply wealthy people, they're wealthy people living lives and having certain lifestyles and certain expectations and certain senses of what should be possible or what you know, limits they're willing to accept or not accept. And in that, in that sense, COVID was much bigger in terms of what it meant in, um, with the citizenship by investment market. Also important too, though, I think is to keep in mind that the wealthy is a really big term. You know, there's a big difference between, you know, the quote unquote ultra high net worth individuals, so, you know, 50 million plus in assets or, or whatever. And people who are just sort of in the low millionaires or so. And all of these events will have different impacts on these different sort of um, spaces within this, you know, it's, it's narrow, it's, you know, the 0.01% or whatever, but that is still differentiated within it. Thank you. Are there any questions over here? Because yes, uh, yeah, in the, in the black shirts. Um, hi, so my question is to Dr. Surak. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard a, a bit of uh, sort of in, in, in when you were talking about the origins of those who buy citizenship and especially in the EU, uh, I heard a bit of diminishment of the significance of Russian citizens buying that. Could you please elaborate a bit on, on that point? And if you have any, any data that you remember, it would be very interesting to hear. Thank, Thank you. you. 
And in the middle, yeah, at the back there. Oh yeah, my question um, kind of goes to the accessibility of information. And I think that oftentimes um, due to the nature of journal articles of academia that it's often geared towards a very specific audience. And so I guess I was wondering how do you work to disseminate information and to make it digestible to the general public who probably aren't going to read a journal article? And in the front here, with your in uh, I'd like to know if there is room to make any connection or some words between uh, what you said about inequalities and the so-called ESG strategies that are popping up nowadays, especially with venture capital investors. So which strategies? ESG, environmental, social, and governance. If, who would like to go first, any of those? Christy, Christy don't. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go for the easy one. <laughs> um, so so the, the point wasn't that Russians are declining among numbers in the EU, and that's a complicated one, especially with COVID and all of that. Right now, you know, there's huge demand, of course, among, you know, people from Russia and Ukraine and looking for alternatives. Um, and most countries will not um, process those applications, um, largely due to, due to US and EU pressure. Even though you can still apply for a residence permit in the US through the EB-5 investor residence um, program, <laughs> even if you're Russian. Um, but the point I was trying to make was that, you, you know, in the general public debate, it's sort of like, these are all Russian criminals. And that, the, you know, even looking at the EU debates, they kind of present it as being all about Russians. And in terms of citizenship by investment, it's only, it's only half, and actually slightly under half. And that's, that's simply, you, you know, if you look at the numbers for Cyprus and Malta, that's, that's what they show. Um, so it's just, you know, trying to correct that sort of um, misunderstanding. Okay. Yeah. I would jump to add something. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just perhaps to, to um, reflect on the dissemination question, uh, it's just a fantastic question. It's something that we, uh, you know, we battle with every day and ourselves are frustrated by it. Um, you know, I think one of the books that I, I showed is was something something like 200 pounds in South Africa. That's, you know, who's only a, the university itself is going to buy it and put it in the library. Um, but, you know, we as a center, we try our best. So, you know, in public media, um, radio stations, you know, that sort of stuff, we try to take our research out there. Um, but that in itself is is also perhaps biased to you know a certain group of of the population um say who read these specific media pieces but but i'd say i mean the radio the radio um and you know a lot of the um the websites that we do publish on um are are widely accessible there's huge data costs in south africa so that's you know it's not just the kind of the paywall with uh, academic articles that are the problem, but also just accessibility to the to the internet. Um, but yeah, we, we also do try to engage with other organizations, advocacy groups, trade unions, and so on. Um, and that's, you know, we're trying to make that into one of our key kind of uh, strategic deliverables um, as part of the center. But it's always a challenge, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have to do anything? Yeah, um, I'd first like to address your question. I, I just have absolutely nothing for you on that. I'm an economic historian. I could answer one of the other questions. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just don't want to like actually ignore your question. But on the dissemination idea, it is this peculiar suboptimal equilibrium we've gotten into. Modern academia is extraordinarily competitive. And we compete for status by publishing journal articles in uh, obscure journals. And um, that not only the general public don't read, but most of our colleagues don't read either. And uh, I don't know what this is. Like I just recently promoted and I, I look at this, I mean, what have I done with my life, you know? I, so, I mean, I think this is the kind of thing, the LSE, by the way, any LSE academic that publishes an article is on LSE research online. I think the marketing of that is, is it could be done better. But I mean, I think there's a certain role and I think like there, you know, any, anything government funded us to have impact now. So there is this engagement. I don't know, I can, I can absolutely assure you, most of my colleagues, if they get a random email from someone who wants to give a talk at some event, 
um, or talk to anybody over the phone from the press, they do it. You know, most academics feel ignored and that, that the world just doesn't care about them. <laughs> Uh, you know, and so basically, yeah, we're cheap dates. So, you know, you know, yeah, it's, and it, but it is about engagement. Some stuff comes across better than others, but stuff by necessity it has to be very tightly defined. And I think all of academia is trying to work that out at the moment, how we best we adapt to that. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think we've got time for one more round of questions. And I know you want to get in, didn't you? Hmm. Are not, uh, are not inequalities of income and wealth? An inevitable accompaniment of a system which is based on capitalism, free enterprise, investment, and the market economy. So if so, should not the emphasis be not on elimination of inequality or just branding it with a bad name, but taking care of and focusing on the more egregious abuses which arise from inequality, such as, for example, market dominance, elimination of competition, corruption, and uh, tax evasion, elections driven by money power, and things like that. Should not these be the focus of attention? And of course, reduction of inequality as a, by imposing succession taxes, capital taxes, progressively high income taxes are welcome, but they will never eliminate inequality. So should not the emphasis be on those together with these? Hey, great points. <laughs> um, back there, glasses. Thanks. I had uh, two quick questions. One was um, on uh, South Africa. Um, I worked in land reform and I was just kind of curious, as, uh, I didn't see it in your graphs. What was the impact of uh, land reform on inequality? <clears throat> and then the second one was uh, for Neil. Um, uh, have you looked at the bottom 60% and just what was the utility of the assets or the wealth? Um, mainly thinking about the standard of living you know, well, inequality may have grown, standard of living for the bottom 60% did also grow. Thank you. And um, yeah, the front here. Um, with, with COVID leading to governments using more emergency powers and generally acting less democratic, do you think this will set a precedent that will allow the rich to gain more access to state decisions and taxation, especially with that? market of citizenship by investment. Thank you. So I think we should do a final round now. And please also, as well as respond to the questions, if you've got any final re reflections about um, how, to deal, how to deal with the challenges of wealth inequality, please, please share them. Neil, should we start with you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mike. This is great. Yeah. Thanks for, for this question. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I, I'll briefly speak to this, this one first. I mean, um, specifically, like the rich getting richer is not a problem as far as I'm concerned, right? Because for most of the 20th century, um, economic growth was pretty much broadly shared by everybody. And we didn't really care about inequality. Certain economics just didn't care. Well, while, while the economy was growing, the rich getting richer, great. You know, and, and the medium are getting richer and the poor are, are doing better too. Um, I think the problem occurs when growth slows down and you start kind of fighting over like, you know, a slower growing pie. And I think that the kind of trade-off is that the social fabric depends on the idea that we live in an equitable society. So if you say that the top tax rate on a, in a state of 100 million is 85%, that's the law of the land, and people don't do it, then you're getting into this revolution territory, right? So I think there's this trade-off with the social fabric, but in the general gist is inequality will affect inequality in talent, you know, uh, in how energetic you are in terms of starting a business. And that's just what the trade-off we make in the devil to have economic growth today. But I mean, there is this kind of back and forth that you have to address. In terms of the bottom 60%, very briefly, absolutely. I've looked at the trajectory of the poor. There is a census of the members of, um, of workhouses in 1860s England, and you can trace their families to today, <laughs> just like the Normans. So like the top and bottom of society. And what's interesting, just to flag some new work, is that you can actually look at ethnic inequalities as well. And in this poor uh, of England, you're seeing kind of this kind of ethnic gradient to uh, inequality that's kind of emerged. Um, what emerged from the data is the position of Irish uh, in England, but also um, maybe some other communities that are kind of more recently uh, flowed to this country. So um, the answer is yes, absolutely. And thanks for your questions, both of you. I forgot what the third one was. So it's fine. I will. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, let me just address your comment. And I, I think if I, 
I, perhaps I disagree a little bit with Neil um, on this and, and perhaps more in agreement with you. Um, I, inequality does have a, it does reflect various things. Only a part of it, is, I'd agree, is with effort um, or the, the sort of just desert argument um, that, you know, Nozick makes, for example. Um, but certainly you see in, in societies in the global south, um, the, it, it's rooted in these uh, inherited privileges. Uh, you know, I, I gave two examples in the case of South Africa, um, but what is clear is that during apartheid, there was huge state support uh, for a minority of individuals, um, state support both legislatively in terms of industrial development, in terms of job protection that allowed, um, that allowed uh, the sort of surplus of, of income that could, uh, that could create this asset inequality. Um, th these edges of capitalism are, are ones that we have to understand, these processes. Um, and currently, as we speak now, in low growth environments, we're seeing companies are attempting perhaps um, things that, uh, you know, would be um, not imagined kind of in contemporary society. So we're seeing land grabs um, across the continent, uh, in various continents um, that are, that with state collusion uh, are often happening. Um, so it's, you know, dispossession by accumulation uh, to take one term. Um, so I, I, I agree that inequality is perhaps an outcome uh, of these various facets of capitalism. And we need to really take um, a hard look at which of these processes are um, destructive um, and which processes can be harnessed for, the, for a more equalizing outcome. Uh, to take the second question on, um, on land reform, uh, land, so you're right in the table, we, there wasn't actually um, an identifiable category of land. And this is something that surprised us a little bit as well. We're investigating that sort of as we speak, but I think the sense is that um, the table that we presented is about personal wealth and much of the land um, has been corporatized. Uh, so it sits on, on the company balance sheets. Um, there's also um, sort of areas of communal land tenure uh, and so on. But, uh, but there's a strong argument that land reform has not actually happened in, in South Africa. So there's been um, a willing buyer, willing seller type of policy that's happened, but it hasn't moved uh, very fast, if at all. Um, so we haven't particularly seen uh, the impact of that yet uh, on equalizing outcomes. Yep, Kristen. Um, yeah, thanks very much for your question. It's a very interesting one. Um, thinking about elites getting more access, um, in a, particularly in a to state decisions, particularly in a post-COVID world. I must admit, I'm a little bit jaded when it comes to um, democracy and oligarchy and these sorts of things. Um, but lobbying, depending on the country, even if we think of it as strong, strong um, democracy, lobbying can be huge. And I think it really is a question of what are the laws around lobbying um, in terms of whether elites can get access to political decisions and how that works, as, as well as campaign funding, if we're thinking about democracies. And obviously, it can work a little bit different in authoritarian regimes. Um, Yuan Yuan Ong, for example, just came out with a really excellent book on um, those sorts of questions in China, where it would operate a little bit differently than it would in the UK, um, for example. But I think in terms of the way that I'm looking at these sorts of things and what the relationship to states on a global scale is looking also at the way that microstates can be disruptors. Microstates have their own kind of dynamics in part because they're so small. So everybody knows everybody else, especially if you're at a sort of a top level. Um, and so it can be quite easy to get you know, access to um, the state apparatus. And, and this is the case across all microstates. But when you start looking at it at a global scale in terms of the rights, in terms of what a state is globally, and there's a lot of, you know, it's almost a hypocrisy in, in some ways to say that these states are equal. They're obviously not. But um, you can get certain things done. Um, and it can be very convenient legally when you have that, the jurisdictional element of the state and being able to work on your own interest. Um, and how that operates within a, in, a, in effectively a, a global ecosystem. So whether COVID has had an impact or not, I'm not quite sure, but I think that those dynamics are really um, powerful um, in, in, in slightly different configurations in different parts of the world. Hey, uh, before we thank the speakers, I'd just like to say this is, is, thank you for coming and I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, 
This is the last event of the NSC Festival. And I also think we should thank all the organizers and all the people behind the scenes who've helped put on such a great series of talks over the last week. Um, and I do believe there is a reception at the back. So anyone who wants to stay for a drink, is please do so. And hopefully you get a chance to speak, to talk to the speakers as well for any further questions. But it only remains to thank the speakers and thank, thank you for your participation and for coming along. Thank you. Thank you.